Hey there, everybody. Right. Yeah, okay. Got my coffee. There you go. Hope you are energized and ready to go as well. This is part two of our sectionalism notes. Remember, here, get in your face for a second. You were supposed to have these notes out, okay, from yesterday. So you can work on those. We are moving on to the North tariffs. So this is still the North. Let me set my timer so I know how long this is. Uh, this is still the North. Okay, but now we're going to talk about tariffs. So what is a tariff? Well, as mentioned many times, I can already see everybody. If you know what a tariff is, feel free to raise your hand right now. See everyone raising their hand in it in class in silence. Um, but anyway, a tariff is a tax on foreign goods. The most important thing to remember at this time is actually this bullet point here, right? It's not there to make the government money. It does do that. And there are going to be times when people want a tariff to do that. But that's not really the end goal, right? The end goal is that American industry is going to be more competitive. So many northerners support the tariffs on European manufactured goods. So you're not necessarily, you don't have tariffs on like everything coming into your country at any given time. You have tariffs on certain goods or industries that you would like to protect um, uh, is usually how it would work. So the reason the Northerners want tariffs is to protect them from the European manufactured goods. Okay, now which Northerners really? And there are going to be a lot of Northerners who maybe aren't necessarily owners who still see why this is important policy, by the way. Um, but owners especially are going to be supportive of this policy because um, they know that they want their industry to grow and they want to be able to build more factories. In order to do all that, they need to sell more stuff. Well, if the other guys... Um, product, and in this case, the European manufactured product, that's the other guy. If the other guy's product is something that is going to cost more now, well, that's pretty awesome for you. And you'll have a better time growing your own industry that way. Um, owners, obviously, then push for that. These are people who are wealthy enough. They can talk to politicians. They can become politicians. Um, and a lot of them at this time are going to be Whigs, uh, though there are Northern Democrats who will try and undercut the Whigs by saying, yeah, we're super cool with the tariff. So it's more regional than necessarily party wise. But if you had to pick a party, that's all about tariff tariffs. It's the Whigs. Um, and if you were like Whig party, what are you talking about? Don't worry. They last about 20 years and then they implode. So, um, which in political party terms, that's like not that long. Um, so, a lot of the Northerners, even if you are not maybe a uh, factory owner, if you're a factory worker, you're going to see the wisdom that, oh, if the European goods flood the market and uh, come in here, then guess what? I'm going to be out of a job pretty soon. So you're also likely to still support that tariff. Um, and again, it's going to be more regional than party. Most Northerners see the wisdom in a tariff. There's exceptions to that. Um, and there's a lot of Westerners who actually are still pretty on board with the tariff, uh, believe it or not, and kind of are like, oh, yeah, we can have industry in different parts of our country work different ways. All right. So next, urbanization and immigration. I just read that backwards. I have no idea why. Immigration and urban. Oh, nope. Immigration and urbanization. Out of control with these markers. So. Lots of people are moving from Europe to the United States in the 1840s and 50s. Um, many of them are German and Irish. Those are the two largest groups. So even now, I think it's something like close to a fourth of Americans have some type of German ancestry. I do. Um, and then my favorite statistic about this, this is a 2023 statistic. There are more people ethnically who are ethnically Irish. So there's more ethnically Irish people in America than there are people in Ireland. And it's like not even close because there are like 4 million people in Ireland, I think. Um, 
And so it's kind of interesting that that's just how important this wave of immigration is going to be. Uh, so basically, a uh, few things going on in Germany. Uh, there's a whole big series in the country of Germany doesn't exist at this time. I can't get into it. It's way too much to get into, even though, you know, I would love to, but you'll have to take a world history or a European history class to one day learn about all the different Germanys that used to exist and became one Germany. But anyway, um, a lot of these smaller countries that made up what's now Germany uh, were run in a very archaic, old fashioned way. Um, like with princes and stuff like that. And they didn't have any sort of like democracy, even a basic version. A lot of them didn't even have like a showy version that wasn't real um, of democracy. The window dressing is what they call that. They didn't even have that. So uh, there were a series of attempted revolutions all throughout Germany in 1848, really all throughout Europe, but we'll talk about Germany right now. And so um, what happened was a lot of Germans who believed in democracy of one type or another. They might even be fine with like a constitutional monarchy situation. A lot of them rose up and had varying degrees of success because again, Germany was a whole bunch of different countries at the time. And then the crackdown came um, from all these German governments led by a place called Prussia, which eventually would unite Germany. And um, a lot of these German, they were called radicals in Germany. In America, they aren't radical, right? Because the thing that's radical about them is just that they believe in some democracy and some representation for the people. So these German radicals um, are called 48ers and they uh, moved to America because they basically, a lot of them had been fighting the revolutionary fight for a while. And then they finally got their chance <sighs> and they got beaten back by the government forces. So they're like, well, forget this. Why waste my time trying to fight for something that already exists? And so they start moving to America. And a lot of them will move. Uh, they might work in factories, but a lot of them do come to like the Midwest. They come to like where we are now um, and set up shop either on, you know, small farms or like we talked about working in factories in these growing towns. Uh, the Irish uh, had something called the potato famine in Ireland. Uh, basically, they grew like one type of potato and um, a very specific disease. And this is why you don't want to rely on just one type um, of anything, really. You want to diversify, like, your food supply. And what happened was a one-two punch. So first, um, there was a disease that can spread through the potatoes. And they actually think, I was just uh, learning in a book I'm reading, um, that... There was also a change in farming techniques that made the potatoes less resistant to this, um, but basically infects the potatoes and it turns them into this mush. Like you couldn't even eat it if you wanted to, which is kind of crazy. So you go to harvest your potatoes and it's just like mush in the field. Uh, it's called a blight. And so this potato blight destroys a whole bunch of the potatoes that are now the cornerstone of the Irish diet. And different species of potatoes, which apparently there are many. I know I read very interesting books, don't I? Um, they can be more or less resistant to this. But when you only have one species of potato growing, uh, you're kind of out of luck if it's vulnerable to this blight, which this one was. And so um, there's not enough food to eat in Ireland. It's like an economic and uh, food collapse because so many of... The Irish relied on being farmers. Um, so that's like the big one punch. It would have been a problem anyway. It's called a famine when there's not enough food for people to eat. Um, the two punch is Ireland was actually ruled by England at this time. It's part of the United Kingdom, kind of an unequal partner in that. And so um, what happened is all the money, the finances, a lot of that's tied up in England. So uh, what potatoes do get grown are usually bought up by English merchants and sent away. So if you were at the time, um, even though there's a potato famine going on, if you went to like an Irish port city, you could still see potatoes getting loaded onto ships and going somewhere else, which is, would probably be incredibly infuriating. Um, but anyway, there's a famine. There's not enough food to eat. Many, many people die. You can look it up. It's called the Irish potato famine. 
and um, many, many more people leave. They leave Ireland. Um, I believe, I'm going to double check my statistics, Ireland is like just now in 2023 getting back to close to the population it had before the potato famine. So um, many of those people, they come to America. And so they're going to mostly stick around, at least at first. Um, they are going to come to New York City. They're going to come to Boston, Philadelphia, places like that. And they are going to work in the factories. Um, now there's a backlash to this. Okay, Immigration is never <coughs> an easy topic to deal with. So there's a group of people there called nativists is what we call them. And these are people who are American and believe that a true American is descended from English people is, is kind of the short of it, though they aren't all necessarily purely English. It's a weird thing. They had some weird ideas about culture. They didn't consider Irish especially, but sometimes the Germans too, they didn't consider the Irish like real white people. It sounds odd to the modern mind. Um, to have like racial hierarchies like that. And so these native born guys were called nativists and they uh, would protest all of this immigration coming in. And sometimes there were clashes of violence. Um, they even had a third party going for a while in the late 1840s and in the 1850s called the Know Nothings, which was a party which was explicitly like his whole deal was just no immigration. Um, and so it was kind of, it was half political party, half secret society, which is weird. Um, they also believed that since all these Irish folks coming over were Catholic, they thought they couldn't do democracy right. Um, which again, it sounds kind of silly now, but it all is them saying that the Irish people would never be able to assimilate. Smash cut 2023, right? We celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Even if you're not Irish, it doesn't matter. And you know, there's more people of Irish descent in America than there are people in Ireland. And everyone's just like, okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> okay, who cares? Um, so it's interesting to see what people really care about in one period of history versus how it ends up. Um, but yeah, there's a big anti-immigration. But in the North, there's jobs. There's places for these people to go. There's jobs. There's cities. Um, and so the immigrants will continue coming to the north, some of them making it to the west. And we'll talk about why they don't go to the south. Okay, because again, it's all economics. Um, so many of them might move to the Midwest, East Coast. All right, cool. So religious and moral views of the north. So as mentioned earlier, many northerners considered slavery wrong. Uh, that didn't doesn't mean that I should go into it. It means that I shouldn't do it, right? I'm going to look on to myself and how I'm going to do that. Uh, also keep in mind, and this is true North and South, if you were to meet somebody from the 1840s uh, or 1850s, there's a good chance um, they would be kind of like one of the most religious people you meet today as far as their actual knowledge of the Bible. Um, they didn't have nearly as, much, as many different things to read. Okay, they did have some, but... Uh, church was also a community place, so even if you weren't necessarily as into it on a belief scale, you're still going. And um, just as far as if you read the same book over and over, this is, this, is, this is a society where in a lot of places, if you are having a casual conversation with somebody, there's going to be like biblical references in it. You're expected to understand, um, and they'll be bringing up biblical stories. And we still, that still happens now, but uh, it's just much more widespread back then. Uh, but it also means the flip side of that coin is if someone does Christianity differently than you, you usually get kind of mad at them. And, you know, you might not associate with them. But anyway, uh, this all is tied to like religion. So uh, for Northerners, right, it's thought of as a moral wrong to do slavery. But like we talked about earlier with views on slavery, most don't want to go end it. But there's exceptions to that. It's usually very religious people. Um, one of the first groups is the Quakers, which is a religious minority in itself, still around. Um, and when the Underground Railroad picks up and when slaves are being uh, brought through 
to get to the northern states and then eventually Canada. Quakers and the free communities of color. Those are the two groups that first really forge the Underground Railroad um, and other folks obviously join along the way. Um, but the Quakers are really into that idea of like, and it's funny because Quakers are pacifists. It's like a Quaker won't fight you, um, but they want to fight slavery. And so how can they do that? Well, they can help people escape it. Uh, and the Quakers are always going to be an important link in that chain. Um, and if you look to the early um, abolitionists, a lot of them are very religious people and they're kind of have this kind of like the descendants of the Puritans that we talked about in um, colonial times, but a lot of things have changed. Okay. Representation and population. So by the eve of the Civil War, the North has around 18 million people living there. The South has 9 million, including 4 million slaves, right? So they get counted, but they don't actually get to vote. They get counted as three-fifths, right? And the North enjoyed an advantage in the House of Representatives, this is why the balance in the Senate is always so important. So even though the North enjoys the advantage in the House of Representatives, if all these Northern congressmen, and again, there are plenty of Northern and Western congressmen who aren't like, we should have slavery in my state, but are like, if slavery wants to go West, whatever. If slavery wants to stay where it is, whatever. So the North isn't as unified in this as maybe the South is. Um, but if something ever gets through the House of Representatives, uh, it'll get stopped in the Senate because the senators will be like, oh, well, we have enough people to stop you from passing this law. OK, and we're going to have a series before Abraham Lincoln of kind of more Southern friendly presidents that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and they might not even be Southerners, but they are kind of like trying to walk this tightrope. You never could forget about the South if you wanted to be president and you never could forget about the North either. Um, so you had to like kind of walk this tightrope again, as much as we kind of talk trash about political parties and that's fine. Uh, when you're more loyal to your region than your party, it creates problems in how our system set up. All right, the South. So, we have this Southern society. It is built like a hierarchy. It's built like a pyramid. Okay. It actually, rather than um, trying to throw off everything of what Europe was like, this is trying to, and it's consciously trying to do this, kind of recapture some of the social structures that exist in like rural England right? Where you have lords and then you have like serfs and peasants and things. So maybe rural England in the 1600s, not even rural England in the 1800s anymore. So at the top, you have this class called the planters who own a lot of times a ton of land, right? These are the Southern gentlemen. They have great manners. They go to fancy parties. They have a lot of money. They own a lot of other people um, and they all are kind of involved in business and you're meant to look as though you are a man of leisure. You don't really do a lot of work is how you want to present it to everybody. Yes, you do business, but you don't do work. There's a difference there. Um, so okay. you're supposed to then occupy your time with other things like joining the military, going to West Point, being a military officer. It's skewed somewhat towards the Southerners um, in this class of people, this planter class. Um, or be a politician or something like that. And this is not like a large group of the population, but they get to run everything. They got all the money. They got the political connections. Okay. So below them, there are what we call the yeoman farmers. These are free whites who uh, owned their land, but probably don't have any slaves or might have one or two. Um, and that person then like works beside you they probably don't get to own most of the like good fertile land, which is, you know, why a lot of people, even from the South are still moving West because um, you could own better land than you could because the good land is all used for plantation agriculture. And then you have poor whites. This is the majority um, just by a little bit in the South. Um, and these people rent their land either from planters or from yeomen 
or they have some other job or they work as a farmhand or whatever. Um, but it's a rural society. So a lot of them are renting their land. It's not usually going to be very good, just enough for you to scrape by. Okay. Um, so you aren't really interacting with the market economy. You aren't buying a lot of manufactured goods, just a few. And so when you hear about tariffs, you're going to be kind of mad, right? Um, and so you have this hierarchy. Now on the bottom of the hierarchy, and this is another reason why uh, a lot of those poor whites might be happy and glad to go to war, um, even though they don't really benefit as much from this system, they aren't at the bottom. Okay, you have uh, enslaved folks, you have free African Americans who in a lot of states, there are still plenty of laws um, based on race, even if you're free. One in 50 African Americans in the South are free. Uh, usually going to be clustered around the cities like New Orleans or Charleston, where, you know, you can have mutual aid and protect yourself from slavers, right? And um, the free African Americans, usually, you know, you're going to have a trade like a blacksmith or a carpenter or something. Um, and these communities were viewed by the Southern politicians as not being a good thing. And as slavery continues and as the 1800s progress, they actually pass laws to make it harder to free slaves, even if you would want to. Even if you want to free your slaves, they're actually going to make it legally more difficult, which is a weird thing. And then below that, I didn't put it on here, but obviously you have the enslaved people on plantations or in farms um, who have to do work and don't have any choice in the matter. All right, so views on slavery. So Southern uh, views on slavery from people who are not enslaved, right, are generally positive. Okay, people who didn't own slaves still benefited from the hierarchy and still enjoyed not being at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, because no one wants to be at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, and a lot of Southerners, there's a lot of faux science. There's a lot of biblical passages used to justify the way things should be. Many Southerners believe that slavery is natural. Right? We've always been doing this. And they love to bring up the Greeks and the Romans too. The Greeks and the Romans did it. We're just like them. And they're awesome. Okay. It's a natural thing. We are white. They are not. It is our job to enslave them. These are real arguments that were used at the time. Okay. And if you try to maybe speak up against this, you're likely to get run out of, time, run out of town. Um, and you could be attacked with violence, legislative action. Books were banned like Uncle Tom's Cabin, you'll learn about that uh, yesterday. Yeah, okay. So Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was my example for the trigger events, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, you're not going to find any copies of that in the South. Okay, it's banned. Like, you're not allowed to read it. So, all right, that's notes day two. Got one more. Have a great day.